go. I want to speak about a lady. Her name was Lillian. And uh, she lived uh, to be 100 years old. She didn't die until 2006. And she was only five years old. But she was somebody very special because she boarded the Titanic with her parents and her siblings, her two older brothers and another sibling. And uh, when this emergency took place on that cold, bitter Atlantic Ocean night, her mother was able to get a spot on the lifeboat and she as a little tiny five-year-old was able to stand between her mother's knees I guess her mother thought she could keep her warm that way and um, her father and two of her brothers couldn't get on so they said well we'll get on another boat and of course that's the last time she ever saw them and she had that heartache for the rest of her life. But when she boarded the Titanic, there were all kinds of details that only an eyewitness would know and take note of. For instance, she said that this ship had just been painted. She noticed the paint job as a five-year-old. And she also remembers the smell of fresh paint. And then when it struck the iceberg, when the Titanic, I guess it was around 11.40 p.m. on the night of April the 14th, 1912, this little five-year-old, she said that when it went down, it was like a building going down. My mother said she would stay with our father and go down with the ship, but he said the children should not be alone. Mm -hmm. And she, my mother, got a seat on the lifeboat. She had Felix on her lap. She had me between her knees. I think she thought she could keep me a little warmer than that. Now, if there were people who thought that there was no such thing as the sinking of the Titanic, and if they actually talked to her, she lived to be 100 years old, uh, they would have gotten disabused of their skepticism because she was an eyewitness. She was there. She saw it with her own eyes. And uh, she even talks about the Carpathian. A woman took off my clothes. My clothes had gotten very dirty and wet in a lifeboat. And uh, she somehow she got separated from her mother. Oh. Uh, there was a, a big uh, drama there until they were reunited. But the, she says, the people on the Carpathian were very good to us. Now, Kepha, who was just a fisherman, I mean, why should we read about a Galilean fisherman 2,000 years later? Are there any other Galilean fishermen that we read about? Absolutely not. Who cares? And who would care about this five-year-old girl that lived to be 100? Well, the reason that we care is because she was an eyewitness of something bigger. And there's nothing bigger than the resurrection of the dead. And then he says, I'm talking about Kepha, the the big fisherman. 
knowing that surely I must put off this tent, this tabernacle, even as our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my demise, uh, you know, after my death, to have these things always in remembrance. He's talking about why he's going to write down his testimony. Aren't we glad that this little five-year-old got her testimony in print? Well, we're even more glad that this fisherman got his in print. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of Adonainu, Yeshua HaMashiach. But we were eyewitnesses. You hear that? <coughs> eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses, <coughs> eyewitnesses of his glory. And, and this is the story of the wonderful book called the Brit Hadashah. And anyone that has a problem with it, maybe they really don't want to believe that there's a resurrection. Maybe they really don't believe that they are very shortly themselves going to put off this tent, this, this mortal tabernacle. They're going to put it off. And their bare soul will go into eternity. There will be no covering. We will be naked before him with whom we have to do. It's appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. And maybe they don't want to think about that. So they kind of repress all of this. But he was ready to meet the Lord, even as a martyr. And you have to remember, this book is a martyr's testimony. Yaakov, of the, the son of Zebedee, was a martyr. Uh, also, uh, Kepha, uh, that I just spoke of. Also, Paul, the apostle. Uh, not only that, but, but Yaakov ben Dovid was a martyr. They wrote down that they saw Moshiach ben Dovid alive from the dead, that the Baranosh on the glory clouds took on flesh, and when he died, because of Psalm 19, verse 10, he did not see Shahat. He was raised on the third day, and they were eyewitnesses. They saw it. As surely as this five-year-old saw the Titanic go down, they saw Moshiach ben Dovid go up, come up from the grave. And this is our hope. It's centered on the Tahiyas Hamasim. This is Judaism, centered on the Tahiyas Hamasim. This is eyewitness glory. Simon Kepha, Yaakov, son of Zebedee, Yaakov, brother of uh, the half brother of, of Moshiach ben David, uh, and Rob Shaul, the persecutor, they all declared the same thing, and many others as well, who, like Stephanos, saw him. Martyr testimony. There he was, alive from the dead, and they saw him. And this book was written down, uh, and we know that we have it. It wasn't lost in scribal transmission. Look, if I was a lecturer, and I had 2,000 people who were trained scribes, who knew shorthand, I guess people don't even know what that is. In the old days, people would take down the, uh, before they would type it on the typewriter, they would actually take down the dictation in what was called shorthand, which was a very uh, cryptic uh, way of writing script uh, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a quick way that you could 
find what you had written and transcribe it later. Well, let's suppose that here I am, I'm a lecturer in a large uh, lecture hall and I'm lecturing. And let's imagine there's 2000 scribes taking down what I said in shorthand. And let's imagine that all of their notes were collected and then they were all collated and compared word for word. Now there would be some uh, disagreements there would be some discrepancies. There would be some misspellings. They might be minor, but there, there, there would be some differences among the scribes. But the basic lecture itself, the, the words themselves would be easily figured out by technical criticism and its canons to put basically what the lecture was word for word with a very high accuracy, 99.9%. .9%. And that's what we have with the Breed Hagashah. Because unlike ancient manuscripts, unlike Pliny, Plato, Demosthenes, Herodotus, Suetonius, Thucydides, Euripides, mm -hmm. Aristophanes, Caesar, Levy, Tacitus, Aristotle, Socrates, Homer. We, we have thousands of manuscripts to compare, just like in that lecture hall where you would have 2,000 manuscripts to compare to actually reassemble what the lecturer had said by comparing them and even uh, tabulating the majority of what the scribes wrote, you could figure out what the lecture was. Well, let me tell you something. Not only do we not have that quality and quantity of manuscripts, but most of the manuscripts have been lost and are rather recent. In other words, let me just take uh, Julius Caesar. The approximate time span between the original and the copy is a thousand years. We don't have anything like that with the New Testament. We can go back to within a couple of decades almost of when the New Testament was, was written by, by some of the fragments that we have that we can use to uh, to to prove that this book was written in the first century. And so we have eyewitnesses. We have a credible text. We have evidence that the New Testament was written in the first century. We have evidence that Yeshua actually existed from Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Lucian of of uh, Samostella and Tacitus and Jos Josephus. A and we know that he existed as a man. We know his personal name was Yeshua. Josephus tells us that. He was called Moshiach or Christos in Greek. He had a half brother named Yaakov as Josephus reports. These are extra biblical reporters, historians. He won over both Jews and Greeks or, or Gentiles of Hellenistic culture. The Jewish leaders of the day expressed an unfavorable reaction. They were jealous. Pilate rendered the decision that he should be executed. That is a fact that we know from Tacitus and Josephus. And these Jews for Judaism that tried to say that there was really no proof that there even was such a person are lying or they are ignorant, one or the other. His execution was specifically written down by Josephus and the kind of execution that it was. And when it happened during Pontius Pilate's governorship over Judea, 
26 to 36 CE. As Josephus implies and Tacitus states. So we have the integrity of the text of the New Testament. We have the inspired writers of the Great Hadashah telling you they know they are writing the word of God, 1 Corinthians 2.12. Galatians 1.11, Ephesians 3.5, 2 Peter 1.20, 2 Peter 3.15, Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. They are writing the word of God. They know they have the word of God and they are writing it down. So if you deny this book, if you ignore this book, you're doing it at the risk of your immortal soul because it is appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. And the original text of the New Testament is reflected in what we have today. And you see on the screen the Orthodox Jewish Bible. It was done over a period of 30 years. And it was done knowing the three key pieces of evidence that we have, which is the witnesses to the New Testament text, the scribes who copied it, and the best methods that can be used to establish and defend the integrity of the text to know that we have what God had written. So the text of the New Testament is reliable because thousands of witnesses point to the existence of an established and consistent original text. And what we did was we backed up the truck and we took the Lubavitcher Messianic ultra kosher terminology and we found the Greek word that we needed to find to match with that Lubavitcher word. And then we put together this Lubavitcher translation, the Orthodox Jewish Bible, which is now going all over the world and which God has blessed exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think because he doesn't want Jews following a false Messiah who didn't rise from the dead. He doesn't want Jews to have a Judaism that doesn't really put as a central doctrine the resurrection of the dead, because the Tehaz Hamasim is in the prayer book. It's everywhere in Judaism. It's very important in the Tanakh. And this is the fulfillment of the hope of Judaism, the whole idea of the promised land. The whole idea of deliverance from slavery in Egypt. The whole idea of coming through the Red Sea to a new life. The, the whole return from the Golas, where God drags off the people, and then he brings them back in a glorious return. He drags them off, he brings them back. Then the Moshiach is dragged off and then he's brought back. And this is why Kepha had no fear of death, even torture and a horrible death like his master. But tradition tells us it was upside down in Rome. We know that he and Paul, Rav Shaul, both were martyred in Rome and we know very definitely what time this happened. And this was what he's writing about in Second Kepha. He wants you to know he's got to take off this tent and go to be with the Lord, but he doesn't want you to miss the fact that the writing is the writing of an eyewitness. And he wants you to remember it and savor it and keep it and not be skeptical and unbelieving. Because as surely as a little five-year-old tells you 
about the smell of the new paint as she boarded the Titanic. So he tells you the glory of the transfiguration and the certainty of the second coming. And not only that, but we know that on the third day, when the resurrection occurred, he was an eyewitness. He saw the empty tomb, and he also met the Lord. And in 1 Corinthians 15, this is all written down. And uh, I thank God for the resurrection of the dead. I thank God for the greatest thing that ever happened in Judaism, that the Savior who can save us is alive. Yosef Hai, he's alive. And every book in the Brit Shah has this in the background or the foreground. The glorious resurrection of the dead. And Lord, I want to pray right now that many will see how their fleeting life will soon be over. And like Kepha, they will have to take off this tent, this body. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God for Moshiach ben David, Baruch Hashem. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, that you appeared over 40 days to all these eyewitnesses and that they were able to write it down and scribes were able to preserve what they wrote and we have it what a glorious thing on my deathbed i will not be asking for a tv or a chessboard or a deck of cards to play canasta I will be asking for my Greek Shah, and it will be clutched in my fingers when I close my eyes in death. It is the most precious book in the world. When God saved me in 1971, he immediately put me in a Greek class. Immediately. Immediately. And what a glorious thing was given to me. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. And since 1971, for 50 years, I've been studying that Greek book. And any poor, unbelieving Jews for Judaism detractor, I can only feel sorry for. Because they don't know the pearl of great price. They don't know Judaism. They don't know the Tachayas Hamasim. It's just a phrase in a Maimonidean creed. They don't know it. They don't understand it. They are lost. And when they're on their deathbed, they will have only a little phrase from the Talmud to chant, which will help them not at all. They will be ushered before the judgment throne and into the outer darkness. And oh God, we don't want that. We are trying in everything we can to prevent that. All the money we're raising is to print this book in Yiddish and put it all over Borough Park. We're not taking this money for ourselves. We're not interested in a Lexus or a summer home or a, a cruise to the Caribbean or a new uh, suit of clothes or a fancy home. We are interested in one thing, putting this book in a shrink wrapped, printed, beautifully bound book all over 13th Avenue, all over Borough Park, the largest Yiddish speaking community in the world so that Yidden 
will have the glory that we have and that they will be provoked to jealousy to read the book that they've never read that is halakhically forbidden for them to even own and that has cheated them from Haye Olam and from real Judaism, what the Hasidim are really looking for, the glory of the joy, the simcha of Judaism and dancing in the Holy Spirit. This is all waiting for them with glory. And oh God, we thank you for this. We give you all the praise. And everybody said, 